now that we are done with um, the initial cleanup of the data, namely uh, correcting motion first, which is what we did in the first step, um, and then making sure that each voxel uh, has the corrected timing. So we did slice timing correction as well. And you should have done this in your data at this point. The next steps we want to do is to make sure that we can prepare the data for um, group level statistical analysis. So we have to um, align each individual brain to an a normalized uh, or, or normalization template. So basically to get it into the same space across different brains. And we'll talk about this um, in a minute. So we're going to talk about these steps here um, where we co-register the anatomical MRI to the mean functional image. And then after that, we segment the anatomical uh, MRI into these tissue probabilities, which at the same time normalizes the image using um, relatively sophisticated algorithms. Actually, they're quite sophisticated. Um, and then this normalization that we get from the segmentation step can finally be applied to the um, functional images so that they're all in the same space and that any kind of statistics we perform on each individual can be um, also done for the entire group of participants that we recorded in our analysis. So let's talk about spatial pre-processing with the goal of cleaning up the data again, but preparing the data for group level analyses. Because this is basically the goal of our analyses. We wish to make generalizations across individuals uh, to make claims about brain function that sort of apply to a broader population, a broader sample. And this can only be done if we have group level analyses. The first step in this is functional to structural co-registration. In fact, it's structural to functional co-registration. Um, the, and the problem that we're facing here is that functional data are of low resolution. We acquire this, this data set very fast. So we sacrifice some resolution relative to an anatomical data set that is of much higher resolution. So we want to make sure that both of these scans are in the same space, are as well aligned as possible, because then we will work with the anatomical data set um, and use the segmentation algorithm in SPM, which will align the um, anatomical image and then we can transform the alignment parameters from the anatomical image to the functional image. So this allows us uh, to get one of the best possible alignments um, for our functional data then by working with the anatomical data. So basically we're doing this functional to structural co-registration because this improves normalization to standard space and with the larger goal of allowing us to to look at at group maps and, uh, later on at, at the, in the final stage where we look at second level models so this is going to be our final goal here um, so what SPM does is what we are going to do is we're going to leave the uh, functional image untouched but we're going to take the anatomical image and match the anatomical image to the functional image such that we know that each region in the anatomical image which was recorded with a different sequence and therefore may be in somewhat uh, different space um, such that the anatomical image then matches the functional image and what SPM does is it's basically using a mutual information algorithm that uh, minimizes some cost function such that when it's done you can predict one image from the other image. Um, so this is the first step that you'll do. And then the second step will involve spatial normalization of the anatomical image. And the reason for this, why do we, why do we need to do spatial normalization? Why not just use each individual's brain and then just look at uh, activations in specific brain regions? Well, it, it allows us to do whole brain analyses rather than just simple uh, region of interest analyses, which 
um, has some advantages. And so we do spatial normalization to get one statistical map from all of our subjects, so a second level model within SPM. Uh, the reason why spatial normalization is so important is obviously because brains differ. You have these stark differences between, for instance, this brain, which is large, and this brain, which is relatively small, or this brain, which may be even smaller. We have specific anatomical, so these are gross anatomical differences, but we have relatively specific anatomical differences as well, such as large ventricles here versus very small ventricles, such as in these brains here. Then you can see that the cerebellum can look very different um, and also cortex with uh, these grooves and ridges. So the gyri and, and sulci on, on the cortex look very different across different brains. There's a large uh, gap here, for instance, that doesn't exist in any of the other brains. So brains, brain anatomy looks very different across brains. Um, so coming back to gross anatomy, so the volume can vary from 1100 to 1500 cubic centimeters. So there are differences of almost 30% possible within your sample. Um, and then you have so many well, differences in, in, in brain shapes and sizes that can be longer, thinner, shorter, or wider. Um, specific regions may differ considerably. And then there is this high variability in gyre and sulci that I mentioned, uh, for instance, here uh, with this sulcus that doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and the location of major landmarks can, can differ as well across brains. So... Um, what we do typically is we normalize the brain. And to, to just give you quickly to tell you what this means is it means squishing each brain into a box that contains a template brain to match the template brain as well as possible. So you're warping the brain in different directions until it matches this brain within that box. So to give you an example, here is... Um, the Talarak Atlas, which is basically an atlas that gives landmarks within the brain. So different brain regions can be identified via this atlas. Uh, it's a very old atlas, but it does provide a standardized brain, and um, but it's not commonly used anymore because it's the brain of an elderly lady um, from the early 1900s, I believe. Uh, we now use the MNI template which is based on, on much more recent brains, and it's the average of 152 um, brains. But there are different types of atlases or normalization templates that are available uh, to, to researchers, but this is one that is commonly used. Uh, so this will be your standard brain, and then you align each anatomical image to this brain um, using this normalization algorithm. We'll go a little bit beyond that because we will use the segment function in SPM, which uh, does a little bit more than just normalizing. But we'll talk about this in a second. Um, so you can have a look at, at uh, this reading here if you want to know more about this. Now, what does this give us? Um, so when we, once we normalize the brain, we can actually talk about regions or activations, let's say, within the brain in terms of their relative location to, to an origin point. Um, the typical origin is actually this anterior commissure point here, um, which is a region in the brain that can be identified quite, quite nicely. But depending on which type of normalization template or atlas you use, um, the origin might change a little bit. So, for instance, in the Talairach uh, atlas, it's a little bit different. Um, but what I want to illustrate here is that you have these relative locations within the brain. So you can go forward, you can go backward relative to this point of origin. You can go up and down and left and right. And each one of them gives you a coordinate um, that you can then cite in your paper. So where's your, your activation center? It is um, at, I don't know, let's say... Uh, 50 um, minus 30 and 12 and those are xyz coordinates relative to this origin space here that you can then talk about in your papers and then every other researcher that normalizes to the same template will know exactly where this is so let me show this to you in in this uh software um 
that you can also download for free from the internet. It's called MRI Crow GL. So you can scroll around in the brain uh, with using this software. Uh, and obviously, obviously each coordinate, so each different location has a different X, Y, and Z coordinate. So let's enter this coordinate here. And, uh, well, let's, let's do this. Uh, minus five. So this is a region in ventromedial prefrontal cortex here. Um, and uh, it has the coordinates minus five, 26, minus 18. So, so this is the uh, left, right coordinate X. So the X is going from, from left to right. Um, y is going from front to back and Z is going from top to bottom again with the um, the location so the, the negative number here means it's below the the origin of the MNI space when it goes above then uh, it's it's a positive number right so we, we this these are numbers that are relative to the origin in these three axes that that we talked about and that, that you have seen in other videos before uh, you can even now check, so now that you have this location in ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, you know exactly where this is. Uh, so when we report these locations, it helps us um, then identify where something is that, that a previous researcher has identified. It helps us do meta-analyses, and that's exactly what, what Neurosense does here, for instance. So this is, when I enter the term ventral medial, I get this I get this location here and then you can click on what's here and um, it gives you um, additional information about this region including all the studies that have found when this region activates and this this uh, paper here by Clithero and, and Rangel is something this is a um, meta-analysis that we've discussed already in the lectures here also showing that um, Activation in this in this region sort of generalizes across different value um, or different types of reward stimuli in, in the scanner.